Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxon. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. On the show today, Paul Gibbons joining us from America. So Paul uh, wrote a book called The Science of Organizational Change. He has a podcast called Think Bigger, Think Better, which had some really big names on, actually. I'm sure we'll chat about some of them. Um, he has a background in Wall Street trading. He used to run one of the first integral uh, business training and consultancy companies, which is called Future Considerations in the UK. Um, yeah, kind of a guy I've known for a while, plays poker, all sorts of interesting things going on. So, Paul, welcome. Yeah. Hey, good to be here. What's your journey with the body? Let's start there. This is the Embodiment Podcast. Oh, God, you know that old quote from James Joyce, Mr. Duffy lived a short distance from his head, from his body. Uh, that's definitely, <laughs> I still think that's a great quote. Uh, not really. I mean, I uh, after I got sober in my early 30s, I had never exercised, never meditated, never done yoga. The only the only thing I did a lot of was dance. Um, and I was pretty dissociated, you know, mentally and emotionally and somatically. So I started yoga uh, in the mid-1990s, and I was a daily, daily yogi for a long time. Uh, and then I got into Richard Heckler's work um, uh, in late 1990s and must have done about 50 days with Richard Heckler. But that's an exaggeration, but not far off that 40 days with Richard Heckler. So that's Richard Strozzi Heckler, who's known as one of the founders of the embodied leadership world. So really one of the, one of the first, if not the first, to bring the body seriously into kind of the mainstream business world. Yeah, he's, uh, he's quite a guy. I think you know him pretty well. And, and so you've, you've worked in that world of consultancy. And, you know, I just name for the, for the listeners some of the clients you've worked with. The um, clients they will have heard of. Yeah, the clients I've worked with? Oh, we've done uh, Future Considerations. We've done HSBC. Uh, we've done Shell. We've done Barclays Bank. We've done uh, Anglo-American. We've done... So big Bayer, names. Bayer. Well All yeah. sorts, right? You could go on forever. And this was a pretty interesting consultancy firm when I came, came across it. You know, a few friends, a few people I know that have been associated with it in various ways. Um, in the, you know, for example, I'm working with um, tomorrow in Russia. Now that sort of traditional consultancy is kind of clever people who come in, they analyze all the facts, they analyze all the data, and they, they tell people how, sort of how to do things better. Um, how would a consultancy that's working integrally with the body be different from that? Uh, well, there's very little that holds a candle to McKinsey, but they don't do anything uh, in the personal development space, or at least, at least not much anyway. They never used to do it. So, so I guess what were the things that we did? So, first of all, we said that leadership development was personal development; that you couldn't develop yourself as a leader without working on the self, and that you know, if I could give you all the training, say in conflict management, all of the concepts and all the steps how you might go through in conflict and negotiation, but if you had a self that retreated from conflict or, you know, a body that wanted to smash someone in the face, evidently wanted to, you know, all of those kind of embodied phenomena to be really familiar to your listeners. So you could do that. So you had to work on the self to develop yourself as a liver. How do you embody your vision? What is, is, is a vision just a cognitive thing? No, you need to touch people emotionally. And that's a, an emotional and somatic phenomenon, especially when you speak it. So, yeah, so that was the, the, the thing. And we also wanted to make businesses, better businesses for the world. So, I mean, I didn't really want to make, help people make an extra 0.1% ROI and help make millionaires into billionaires. That wasn't really something that got me excited. So I really saw my work as working. Um, when we started to work with KPMG, we were working with a bunch of partners who made a million pounds a year. And, um, and they're obviously a very, you know, wealthy elite firm. And I thought, am I really going to spend my days helping to make these buggers more money. Uh, and I had to sort of transform my attitude towards it and say, you know, these are human beings. They have, they have kids, you know, they have people that work for them. And uh, mm. how can I make their journey, you know, better, more fulfilling? How can I make KPMG a better place to work? So, so we also worked on making businesses better places, including carbon neutral businesses and stuff like that. So it was a pretty cool firm. Yeah, I've heard good things, and I, I said my points of contact with them have been really positive. And I, you know, this might sound quite obvious to our listeners in a way, like, hey, if you want to be a leader, you need to work on yourself. 
or yeah. I mean, <laughs> yes, you know what I mean. Like it's sort of like I mean maybe I've been in this world too long, bald. You know what I mean. I'm waking yeah. up slightly bleary eyed in Moscow uh, today, no. and this is just my life. You know, waking, traveling around, doing this uh, stuff, and, and it's and all, all the idea of hey, maybe you want to bring your values to work, like. Like, this isn't this obvious? I mean, to some of our listeners, it might be shocking that there needs to be a sort of consultant who comes into some of the companies full of some of the cleverest people in the world and yeah. tells them this. Uh, it is strange to you. First of all, it was a long time ago, so it was in two, two, mm. two, I founded the company in 2000. Um, but it's certainly, <laughs> if you look on LinkedIn, there'll be all sorts of quotes you know, that are supposed to be deeply profound about mm. leadership being related to working on the self. So I don't know. It, it was, is, was revelatory then because what's the alternative? The alternative is a bunch of theory. And I've certainly taught a bunch of that. Since I started teaching at U.S. business schools, uh, the approach to leadership there is theoretical. It's lots of PowerPoint slides and lots of concepts. Very little of the stuff that we do, for example, I mean, even, you know, even role play. <laughs> right. And Something like that. Paul, do you mind if I keep jumping in, but we're mates, so you can probably just jump yeah, in over and talk to each other a little bit. Do what you want to uh, do, man. Cheers. Um, so I wonder if things have changed a bit, though, in the, in the sort of 11 years I've been running my company. They, you know, Future Considerations were one of the first in the UK when I, was, when I was setting up, but it was one of the only people who were also doing anything with the body and business. And now that's become more common. It's still not everywhere. But, you know, the fact that I'm in Moscow with McKinsey and I'm talking to them today and tomorrow, it's like, you know, that's a pretty mainstream company. And they're exceptional in their own ways. But there's, you know, it's a sign that something has crossed over. And, and the names you mentioned, those companies, they're not the sort of weird, fluffy little Brighton companies. They're, they're, they're fairly big ones. I, I wonder if this is coming in. I've, I've definitely seen the values and the conscious business and some sense of, you know, CSR and things like, sorry, corporate social responsibility and things like that come in. So do you think these ideas are taking off or do you think it's still a, a tiny minority of people in, in these environments? Uh, yeah, it's a tiny, tiny minority. I think, um, you know, there's something that I read about in one of my books called the availability bias. And that's the very stupid and obvious idea yes. that you could only, you can only, uh, you can only figure, you can only, um, calculate from what you can see right you only yes. wait to what you can see and and so yeah so you're you're uh that is amazing right i mean they're towering force in the consulting world world oh no disrespect the, to them the best of the, the best of the best well known yeah I'm just saying them as an example of a extremely sort of um well thought of well-known organization but as sometimes i'm wondering this this um bias and we'll talk about more of the biases later actually if it's just, you know, I'm in that world now, and I wonder if this is a danger for all of us who are in these unusual worlds. Like, you know, you play poker. Maybe you think everyone plays poker, but, you know, my mom, yeah. for example, is still surprised when she hears that, I don't know, I have a friend who's a semi-pro player, and my wife's a semi-pro poker player. She's, <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing, she said. She didn't even know you could earn money from poker. She just thought it was a game that you lost money on. Um, so it's, I wonder if the worlds we're in do make quite a big difference. Well, let's take it. Let's take it. Let's take it. Let's take a your average training and development person who works at yeah. I don't know Barclays Bank or they work yeah. at Tesco's or whatever. They're in charge of training and development for they'll have tens of thousands of people, right? And and what are their how are their objectives constructed? Their objectives are constructed often on not producing business results or not producing behavioral change in people, but on putting some bums in seats. Let's deliver everybody needs to have an onboarding program, a five-day onboarding program. Mm. Or everybody needs to learn how to manage performance better because we want to change the culture and manage performance better. Well, you know, how are they evaluated? Are they evaluated by people wandering around the business clearly behaving in a new way? No, absolutely not. Embodiment isn't foremost in their concern, and they would only probably have the really weakest definition of what embodiment means. So I think the paradigm is very much is learning happens between the years. Right. I'm so afraid. That's, still do that's still dominant, but there's these sort of small green shoots we see springing up. And I've, you know, I have noticed the idea has got easier to sell in business in the over the 11 years I've been working. And it's, it has definitely got a bit easier to sell. I think mindfulness and emotional intelligence have opened the door for people to start talking about the body. 
Well, when we did some of this at KPMG, one of the partners said to me at the end of the program, he said, you know, if I'd known what you were going to do with us, I would never let you in the door. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a fear there, isn't there? I mean, that speaks actually though, to a real fear of the body in many of these corporate environments. Well, we had to working with pads, for example. If we said you were going to be working with pads and speaking a declaration. By tads, you mean like tie boxing pads? Like tie like boxing like pads. pads. Yeah, we had yeah. them doing, you know, yeah, what Richard Heckler calls uh, spirited commitment to dignity. If we yes. told them that we were going to do, what, you know, walking in the room, they'd have told us to get stuffed. I mean, you know, um, if we told them they were going to do Tai Chi and meditation every morning before the class, yeah. <laughs> they'd have told us to stick it up our <laughs> Yeah. What I find with the clients is I... I go in and say, listen, what is it you want? And they say, okay, we want I don't yeah. know, leaders who are more impactful, for example. Yeah. And I say, great, I can help you deliver that. And, you know, there's the methods are going to be interactive. And I go, okay, interactive. Interactive is good. That's not PowerPoint. You know, everyone's bored of PowerPoint. And then they realize what interactive is. And it's a little bit like, whoa. But by that point, there's enough buy-in where people, if, if they want it, the aim, they're almost willing to do any method. And when there's enough, when there's trust built slowly over time, People are just people. Uh, and I know some of the listeners to this might have sort of what I call enemy images of kind of anyone in business, you know, some sort of evil person in a suit. And uh, my fun people are just people. And fundamentally, well, I might have to go a bit slower on that trust building than I would with a group of hippies at the Buddhafield Festival. It's essentially the same process of, of, of creating, you know, finding the motivation and creating and building trust to then do the methods that are going to do the job. No, I mean, I'd love to see what you get up to with your clients. I mean, you're going to remember the stuff I was doing was 2005 or 2004. Yeah. We sold this program to KPMG. Uh, the world's moved on that your thinking has moved on a bit over the last dozen years, right? And uh, the corporate world has moved on a bit. So I'd be desperate and curious just to sit, be a fly on the wall during one of your <laughs> programs. Um, you're but, always uh, welcome to come and uh, turn the flip chart for me, Paul. <laughs> You'd be the most overqualified flip chart turner in the world. I'd be the, the, fl- the flip chart cutie. Um, and and so, so, so say more about this, like how things are measured, because I know quite a lot of people listening to this may work in training or they may have contacts in training sure. or they might be, say, yoga teachers who want to work in business. It's sure. well, tra- thing. Training is really evaluated now. Mm. No organization that spends. So KP, KPMG, one of the KPMG partners, he says, I don't know. I don't know within the nearest million pounds what this company spends on training every year. So that's interesting. He was the managing partner. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty interesting. And uh, the, our training was only ever evaluated, uh, I think, in almost any firm working for the best firms in the world. I mean, Shell is the most best regarded organization, development organization in the world, uh, was only ever evaluated by Happy Sheets. Yes. And, and he, actually, this, your, your ex company brought me into Shell, actually. It was quite interesting in Holland. And I had just for the, for the record, for people that listen there, Happy Sheet is one of those bits of paper you get that says, what did you think of this training on a scale of one to five? That's it. Were you happy, you know, mutual? Was the, was the trainer a nice bloke? Uh, so it's like, I've realized as a trainer, I, I can go in and I can, I can get those ratings just by being nice to people. Yeah. Or I can actually go in and serve the shit out of people really help them and they'll get lower ratings because it involves challenging them so like i you know that's my first point would just be like what could be measured with that and also just want to open this up a little bit the average yogi or dance teacher that's or martial artist who's trying to do transformational change wouldn't even do that wouldn't do what wouldn't even do a happy sheet like, oh, no. like, oh yes, like of course. Yeah. Idea, I don't do a happy said, sheet after my yoga class. Yeah, of course I don't. If you said, if you said to the average person, and I'm, we're coming at it from a particular point of view, and I know there's going to be pushback from listeners, but if you're saying we're doing transformational change, we're actually change, we're significantly changing something in people, and you're paying money for that, how do you prove that if there's no measures? Well, here's what the research says: is that those happy sheets are uncorrelated mm. with behavioral change on the job. So they, te- they, tell you, they, tell, they tell you how good people feel and yes. how much they like the trainer and how much approval they had for the thing. They don't tell you anything about how much people change and what you say about challenging people. Yeah. And here's the thing. We've, we've gotten tossed out. Of, we almost got tossed out of our client for challenging someone. We had a psychotherapist on the team who did some really heavy duty interpersonal work with someone. She started crying yes. and she was reported to chief executive. The chief executive said, if that happens again, you're out. You upset someone. 
that you know we don't we don't want people being upset we want people to be happy to tick that yeah issues. yeah i i uh when i when five people turned up late for the there were 12 partners in this course and they all pitched up about 30 minutes late for this three-day course or something like that. Said, so do you run your business and your lives like this? Like, what kind of integrity do you guys have? And they completely lost their shit with me. <laughs> wanted me off the program and whatever. And the chief executive finally said, you know, uh, we didn't enjoy hearing that. We didn't enjoy the way you delivered it, but it was exactly what we needed to hear. So anyway. Yeah, I've, I've, the companies that I've worked with where I have challenged people are, on things like basic stuff like but you know being late is a good example there's this basic integrity can you run a business if people are breaking promises to each other and that's a very concrete promise you know hey you said you'd be here you weren't here all right you know stuff like that i think very very much serves people challenge on even though it's an uncomfortable conversation um i mean you know let's take this sort of wider than the yeah, yeah. general embodiment world <laughs> How do you know someone's getting real behavioral change out of what's claimed as you know, such, such a transformational tantra course or a transformational leadership course? Um, how do you, how could you measure it then if not through happy sheets? Uh, well, I mean, if you're a human resources person, you could, you can do behavioral interviews. So you can say, I don't know, if you're training someone in performance management or something like that, that you can ask about frequency and you can ask about effectiveness and you can do, you know, have they actually changed the way they conduct performance management interviews and performance management reviews so you can do behavioral assessment. That's a fair amount of work. However, yeah. you know, there's something, there's something from the training literature. It, it's sort of a bullshit number. It's kind of made up. But anyway, that only 10% of training is transferred to the job. So yes. let's l listen to that. We have a lot of corporate trainers perhaps listening in. That was like some thing from 1981 where some expert on training transferred 10% transferred to the job. And if you think yourself, if you, you're, you're a corporate trainer, I'm a corporate trainer, you've got corporate trainers listening, what percentage, take your best student in the class, what percentage of what you offer them do you think is taken up? What do they walk out of the room with? What percentage? You're, you're asking me in terms yeah, of the yeah. work well, that I do? Yeah. Or the, yeah, you know, I, I have a question, like, let's just take the embodied facilitator course, right? Yeah. I'm, again, I'd have a question of, like, how much of that is translating back into people's um, actual, actual work? And what, we've, what we did this year is we did video exams where they videoed a client, and this client was in their normal environment and oh. fine with their normal work. So if they were coaches, it was a coaching session, if it was a training. If it was a tango class, a tango teacher, it was a tango session with embodiment. And what was really interesting is, is they did get a good degree of the basics that we taught them. So maybe they were clearly using sort of a good chunk, maybe not half, but a good chunk of what we taught them. But I was also quite shocked at how much hadn't translated. And this is a, you know, a year-long transformational course, high-end, one of the best things, I think, is in the field. And I go, okay, this person is now doing basic centering, basic four elements, which is one of our base models. It's competent, but they were doing way better when I saw them practicing on the training course um, because now they're in their own environment. It's a few months later. They've had to combine it with their own stuff. And I'm, I'm seeing something of value transfer. Like, you know, most people pass their exams. But simultaneously, it was an insight for me because previously, we'd only ever examined them like on a module, like on a training module. Yeah. And this was much more like them in their actual lives. And that was a, that was a wake up call for me. You've, you've, you've taken a step that nobody I know has taken a step of that you just described of actually videoing, videoing. Now, obviously work is well suited to that, but actually videoing and trying to pick up behaviorally what's changed. And yeah, context matters. I mean, yeah, they've forgotten it or they've fallen out of practice or they had a centering practice and now they don't any longer or the workplace is too stressful or they're tilted. So it's much harder to center all of that. So yeah. All so say what tilted is. That's a poker oh, tilted. Term. It's a poker term, but I use it in general in everyday life. It means um, triggered, but triggered, triggered, triggered off center, not at your best. So this yeah. is in poker, for example, like my wife lost her grandmother not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And she didn't play poker afterwards because she said, I'll be tilted. I'll be emotionally reactive. I'll be playing more, too emotionally and I'll lose money. So she yeah. said, I'm not going to play poker for, you know, while I'm in this kind of mourning period. Good for her. Um, that's, that's, which is great self-awareness, right? She wasn't like, hey, I'm going to go play poker. And, and, you know, I'm pretty sure she wouldn't mind sharing this. But, um, you know, it's yeah, great self-awareness there. Yeah, it's triggered. It's a little less new agey than triggered. 
<laughs> that's, yeah. that's a little bit less social justice isn't it <laughs> but, you, but you are you um you i mean you do something uh you i mean you always t- you take a risk and there's a sort of level of self-honesty so you and i are saying okay our very best students maybe get about half transferred to the job yes or something, but less yes. something like that is that the way the training world has to be and uh, we, if we're doing better and i think we are because we talk about embodiment we talk about skills transfer and we talk about people using it um isn't there, you know how much money spent globally on training and development? I think it's a hundred billion dollars. I mean, it's a lot of money being pissed away. So maybe that's the way it is. I mean, maybe you just throw a whole bunch of stuff at the wall and hope it sticks to some people. But I think we can do better than that. Yeah, and I'm also obsessed with this question, like how do you get yoga learning off the mat? How do you, like the amount of time I spent in Aikido, physically studying, and I, you know, I think as embodiment people, we can't think, oh, we've got embodiment, therefore this isn't an issue for us. Like, I spent years in Aikido learning models of sort of harmonious listening, blending, and the conflict resolution. And that did not transfer into my life. I, I was not the most harmonious, blending, conflict resolving person that's out there. Uh, and all, the, you know, yoga could be viewed simply as something pleasant, like a holiday from reality. But many yoga teachers would say they're helping people change through yoga as people. And, and I've just met so many asshole yogis. So I've become very skeptical of that claim. I'm not convinced. I mean, Richard Heckler says that you're working, are you working on the body or th- through the body or with the body? That's yes. his, those are his three. Uh, you studied with him for a bunch too, so you know all his stuff inside and out. Yeah, yeah I lived with him for a little bit. Um, so no, I, I, he was a mentor for me for a while. He's certainly one of the most influential people. In this yeah, yeah, so working on the body could be massage or it could be going to the gym or it could be going to a yoga class. You're working on the body. Um, and working with the body or uh, working through the body. And he's, you know, this, well, I guess you won't be a familiar, you know, the, the self is the body, the body is the self. So, but I mean, yeah, I, I leave my yoga. Uh, I mean, even after all the work I've done, you know, I, I leave my yoga training in the yoga room. Most of the time I leave my gym work in the gym. I'm not, I don't have a narrative in the gym where I'm building a body. Actually, I sort of sometimes do when I run, I'm building a body for endurance. I'm building a body, body that has stamina. But but, yeah. but but rarely, but rarely, but rarely do I connect a narrative to my embodiment work that I do. Almost. Yeah, and I, just, I guess it depends if that's your intention or not, right? I mean, to say in the gym, that's maybe just not your intention in any way. So it's like, okay, no harm, no foul, right? You're just, you're, you're in the gym, you're there trying to build your muscles or lose weight or whatever. That's a different intention uh, fundamentally from, from someone that's work, that is actually trying to work through the body or at least with the body. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I'm just missing a trick, right? I don't need to, don't need to do that. I mean, it's just constructing a narrative. What's the self I'm trying to build when I'm there? I don't really, I don't really do that. Well, yeah, and you absolutely can do that with strength training. And I, I think of it also almost like an extra layer because you still get the physical. Do you know, in the same way as you can be running on the treadmill and getting the physical, you can pay attention and you start building mindfulness, or you can actually be working on your ability to move. Uh, actually building a powerful kind of aerobic self, which is more than just a physically aerobic self, but a self of action and movement and doing. And I, I think that's, that's, it's just like a piece you can add. And I know some of my yoga students have sort of say, you know, they sort of say, now, why would I do purely physical yoga now? Because I can still do the physical part. I just have this extra layer that's such a bigger win for my life. Huge. And, and you know, you have the opposite pro- problem uh, with your people that, most people, 99.9% of the corporate training world, they'll be working on the narrative and forgetting the body. And, you know, you may have some people that are working on the body and forgetting the narrative. That's a good point. That's a good point. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Anything more you want to say on sort of measuring training or actually re- how, do we, how do we figure out if we're not wasting our well, time? Like- well, they, well, they don't, right? So first of all, companies don't. So they're not holding us to account. And the reason they're not holding us to account is they'd have to hold themselves to account. So the person who's paying us, the training and development, yes. the HR, yes. HRD, HRD person, would have to hold themselves to account to a higher standard, producing business results, producing behavior change. Who wants that? Yeah, no one's, it's, it's <laughs> who wants funny, to be, isn't it? Who wants to be accountable? No, one, no one's motivated, are they, to do it? Because it's, it's, if you're, if you, it's, as soon as you say, look, I hired this person, I might have just wasted millions of pounds of this company's money or thousands of pounds or whatever it is, right? So no one really wants to be accountable because that's <laughs> it's much easier just to go, okay, we got sure. someone we in got, and we got, the, we got, it and- got the bums on the seats. We got the guy who's the best in the world. We got we bought in if we're the sort of company that hires or we got 
you know, we've got future considerations in. Oh, yeah, well played. Job done. Box ticked. And then, and then the kudos is there and no more needs to happen, right? So it's, uh, <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. Box yeah. Ticked. How many people I mean, did you train? Oh, we got, you know, we got 450 people through the program. Well done, son. That's a good job. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's the that's the paradigm. I mean, that's the paradigm. I mean, that's the paradigm in 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 the world, right? Is that we don't really care about we care a lot about people's intentions. Like, you know, here's this old statistic from my book: ninety five percent of people want to lose weight. What percentage of people in a, in a given year lose weight? Five percent. What percentage of that carry on into the next year? About a quarter. So, I mean, like, you know, embodiment is something that's missing from you know, obesity, it's missing from addiction, it's missing, uh, you know, in pro-climate behaviors, it's, you know, it's missing, I mean, all over the world, you look at people who are being, measuring themselves by their intentions, when you want to be judging them by, the, they want to be judging themselves or evaluating themselves by their actions. I mean, this is like, this is what's wrong, a lot of what's wrong with the world, right? We have a lot of well-meaning people who are doing fuck all. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I like the skepticism you bring here. And I think this is one thing you're really strong on, you know, like when I listen to your podcast, you have a lot of um, guests on there who are very rational people, scientifically minded. You're looking at a kind of evidence base, this kind of piece. Right. And let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, skepticism, like healthy skepticism. What might that look like in an embodiment world? What are some of the thinking errors people make? Can you talk a little bit about that, that, that area? Well, uh, yeah, it's an interesting area. I mean, I, I had my own journey. So in the 1990s, I was the new age poster boy. I did everything from running butt naked through the woods, doing Native American sweat lodges and rituals on three-day courses. I did a ton of ontological work with Landmark Education. I did spirituality workshops where we were trying to channel, channel through our, uh, what's the name of the chakra at the top of the head? Um, chakra. Yeah, I would try to, I mean, I did uh, absolutely everything. In fact, every weekend of my life when I wasn't working full time at PricewaterhouseCoopers was devoted in some way to some sort of new age personal growth. So that was my life in the 1990s. And I was a recovering alcoholic. So in, in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're persuaded to or you're encouraged to or maybe even stronger than that, believe in a higher power. So I'd adopted some sort of vague theism, theistic belief. And then it, uh, I actually went to write a master's thesis on spirituality at work. And I, mm. that was my sort of 15 minutes of fame back in 1999 or 2000 and something like that. And doing that work, and I looked at the research on like, are spiritual people, you know, more ethical? And the answer is no. Are they happier? The answer is no, not necessarily. So all of the research was telling me, you know, sort of what's the point. And at the time, I was doing some really heavy new age stuff in Santa Barbara, California. And just some of the rituals were just left me saying like, what the fuck am I doing here? I'm sorry. Yeah. Do, do you allow swearing? So yeah, anyway, you, you I, can, you I, can I, swear. I, you can, I, you can go, you can go full cunt. No, all right, all right, all right, all right. Like it's, it's, it's for as much as you want, folks. <laughs> so I had, to, I had this, just this transformational epiphany. Like, I don't believe any of this stuff. You know, I'm, uh, an atheist. I'm a guy who thinks that, you know, you you need to have justification and evidence for your beliefs. And, yeah. and that was actually really a hard thing to do. I had a sister in the hospital yeah. then who was very close to death. And I desperately wanted a yeah. big guy in the sky to take away my pain and to be yeah. better. Anyway, so that was my own journey. So yeah, so that's from being like Mr. New Age to Mr. Sort of uh, skeptic, if you want. Yeah. And you know what? I've seen a lot of people in the embodiment world make this kind of journey where they start off maybe a little too rational or yeah. not too rational, but certainly reductionist in their rationality. So that it's coming from worldview, first of all, of like, you know, nothing's special, nothing's magic. Um, and actually being very, very skeptical, um, not skeptical. First of all, just coming from that point of view of mainstream kind of culture. And then they go kind of too far the other way and they kind of take on board anything at all, you know? Yeah. So it's just, just start believing any old nonsense. And then eventually come to some kind of balance between the two. That seems to be the general journey that I'm seeing people make in embodiment. Is, and then some of them don't make all of that journey. You know, it's pretty common in the the world of these kind of things to believe pretty much anything without any kind of evidence base. And I, I find that surprising when it's intelligent people who are doing it. Yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting thing. Uh, it's, it's definitely an interesting thing. And I mean, I probably lean too far too hard. It's like if there's not evidence for it, you know, if, you know, if you can't prove it, it's you know not worth not worth talking about. What what I see in the states is a 
a real device, a division between sort of, we don't have it quite as extreme in Europe, you know, and you've lived this, you know that. There isn't quite, if you don't believe in evolution in the UK, you're a bit odd. You're, you know, you're uh, nobody, so nobody gives a shit. Yeah, it's just like, okay, you're a crazy religious person. That's nice. Good for you. But it's not really taken seriously, like, I don't know, in Kansas or something, where they oh, might ban the pe- People wear their religion and their spirituality in, in Europe really lightly. They wear it like a light cloak. In but America, equally, the- America has a badge of honor. It's a sort of really super part of your identity, whether you're from Boulder, California, or whether you're from Kansas or Oklahoma. It's who you are. And the atheism, too, is like that, because the atheists equally have almost like, I mean, uh, our Richard Dawkins kind of does well out there because the atheists have this almost religious quality to their atheism. You know, it's not religious, but it's um, there's a way in which it sounds almost religious as, as they push it on, you know, as they, well, they we're kind a of huge, have this c- yeah, conversion we're, mentality almost around Yeah, it, but know? we're a huge minority over here, and, and, and in many ways we're uh, an oppressed minority. I mean, you know, my kid has to uh, has to say the American, whatever you call it, Pledge of Allegiance that got the word God in it. And, you know, his friends used to quiz him for why he didn't go to church and school. And they have prayers before, you know, city council meetings and, mm. and football teams, you know, when they go out to play a game, they'll have a little prayer before they go out in the field. Uh, you know, atheists are, are in a sense, uh, uh, I know you don't like the use of this language and I don't, wouldn't want to carry it too far, but they're in a mi- minority uh, in this country. And yeah, they're, they can be strident and they can be arseholes. I mean, I can be strident and I can be an arsehole. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. 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 This, this is definitely more extreme out there. And I, I, I don't think people in America necessarily realize that because you go to Europe and you see all the churches and you think, Oh, we must be as religious, but there's a real difference there. Um, uh, you know, I, how do you see this playing out in the space of like yoga and dance and martial arts? Like, you know, people I've got, I've heard in Aikido people say, and, and this will, uh, they'll talk about their key energy or they'll talk about this or they'll talk about that. And I'm just, oh, in yoga, I'll be sitting there and going, really? That sounds oh, yeah. like an entirely unexamined belief. Uh, we had Ariana Rabinovich on the podcast, for example, who, yeah. um, she does yoga myths. And she's written a whole book about all the myths in yoga, about what cleanses this or what, you know. Right. And it's not to say there's nothing going on from some of these esoteric systems like the chakras, for example. It's a very interesting system and you can actually work with it and create some interesting results. Uh, but a but kind of unexamined way of looking at these things strikes me as unwise. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, I mean, the old divide between faith and reason, video, video rashes was a uh, video, what was it? ratio or something like that was a papal encyclical it was thomas aquinas is about that there's a world of that you can know through faith and there's a world that you can know through reason and so yeah so a lot of people in in the new age community live in a world where they have a lot of faith in unseen things so i think there's an arrogance in it there's a an arrogance in saying i have magic powers and like I'm trying to get to the root of this because there, there is something seductive. It's, it's narcissi- saying, it can be narcissistic as well. It's like you yes, have a, but the universe doesn't really give a fuck. You know, you know, you're there are a hundred billion stars in our galaxy, and there are a hundred billion galaxies. You think this? You know, you think that a little four-legged hairless mammal on a rocky planet preoc is the you know, the universe, which is code for God in new age world is preoccupied with your happiness and satisfaction and what you do with your life. I think that's, that's, that's just a crazy view, but you know, I mean, there is a narcissism there to say, you know, the universe cares so much about me that, that they've uh, put this parking space for me. <laughs> oh yes, that's right. That's right. You know, it's, or, and I, and I, but again, I'm still curious. I've, had people, people, I've had people say that. I've had, I know I've literally heard that one. I've literally heard that one. Yeah. Like, oh, I invent this sort of the secret stuff of, you know, this is an absolute no no on the podcast. If anyone does it, I just challenge the shit out of it straight away. Yeah. It's that if I think something, it becomes real. I mean, what could be more narcissistic than that? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to take their fun away from them. You know, I don't want to really take people's belief in God away from them as long as they keep it away from, you know, they keep it, they keep it private. I mean, you know, if, if it makes them happy, you know, in a way, you know, you and I talked about libertarianism. It's like, all right, whatever floats your boat, man. Well, I um, think there's a difference when you say, you know what, this is actually actively dangerous when it's affecting, say, a government's policy on climate change, for example. It is. Um, 
or even just, the, you know, like as someone working in this field, it's like, I don't want people to waste their time. I want people to invest their time in what works. And the more fantasy there is, the more people are wasting their time. But without becoming kind of dictatorial about it and saying, well, everyone has to sort of believe the same things. And, you know, that's equally unhelpful. Well, once, um, you, once you open the door to the sort of the super rational beliefs or something like that, you can get in a word of trouble. I mean, I remember I posted something on homeopathy and all my atheist scientist friends on Facebook like, yeah, 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 homeopathy, pile of shit, pile of shit, waste of money. Uh, yeah. you know, the NHS was spending 100 million bucks on some new age homeopathy. And I had a very lovely very centered challenge from a woman. She says, I use it with my kids and, and I think it makes them better. And I said, well, you know, what do you say about that? Just because you give it to them and they get better, colds get better by themselves, right? You know, and sure. you usually give it by the time they're pretty sick. So yes, it does get better, but it doesn't shorten the length of a cold. No, it doesn't. And she said, you know, I trust my instincts more than I trust doctors. And I just thought, I just felt really sorry for her. I mean, you know, it's like, really? I mean, yeah. But there's a lot of people that live their, live their lives like that. They trust their gut. In fact, Donald Trump famously said, my gut gives me better information than I get from people's brains. So, so let's, let's talk about this, like challenging some of these um, biases then. Because, you know, from an embodied point of view, gut instinct sounds good. And I think there is such a thing as intuition. And it can be a great way of tuning into something that does matter. And, sure. and, and I think the more... I'd, I'd, I'd use this as a way of checking intuition, as a way of yeah. checking its real true intuition you're tuning into and not just a bias. Like, for example, if you grow up around people of a eth certain ethnicity, yeah. they don't put you into a fight-flight response when you see them. However, if you don't, let's say you grow up only around black people or Chinese or white, when you meet those people later yeah. in life, there's yeah. a slight effect that can be physiologically sure. measured yeah. That doesn't go away when you get training. It's who you grow up with. Um, there's an actual different physiological reaction. So I might be biased against yeah. those people just physiologically. I'm in a slightly different state. And that will intuitively feel like, oh, something's up That's here. an amazing you're example. Because actually, if you're hiring and, you know, you know, that candidate just didn't feel right. You need to use your rational faculty to say, oh, yeah, it was an Asian woman. Or, oh, yeah, it's a black guy with the with an urban accent. I wonder, I wonder if that's that, that kind of my, my bias at work there. Do you need to do what you just described as kind of interrogate your intuition and just make sure your intuition is, you know, not leading you astray. There's a lot of people who just drive the, drive their, their lives based on gut hunches without ever performing the check that you described. So, yeah. What are some of the other biases that exist then? So I think there's a whole sort of body of work based around this that I think would be really useful for embodiment teachers out there to know about. Well, there's the 95% there's the of how about the illusory, uh, the, the, the illusion that we know better than other people, which we all have. So if you quiz people, 95% of people think they're an above average kisser. <laughs> driving's the same isn't it driving is the same 90% yeah, exactly. of people think they're above average at driving yeah and, and again there's no data on that like right have they how many people have they really surveyed about their kissing for example like yeah. like like how would right, you we, measure that 45 percent of you are wrong that's what you can be sure of that 45 <laughs> percent of you aren't above average right sure um, so, yeah. we, so we know that most people are inaccurate in this and you overly self-assess. Yes. And you'll also overly assess yourself situationally and other people dispositionally, right? So you'll yeah. say, the reason he did that is he's a bad person, but the reason I did it is I'm having a bad day. Yes, that's right. That's called the fundamental attribution error, whereas you attribute things that people do to aspects of their character rather than the environment. So, you know, it's, you, race is a very good example of it. You know, that black guy must be lazy maybe not you know maybe <laughs> maybe he's lived a life that you can't begin to comprehend yeah, in terms of personal difficulty. and you don't want to go too far with that as well but we tend to blame the individual rather than the system and, well, uh, it, 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 and not just blame but also credit so I'll, I'll see this when i'm teaching embodiment yeah one of the big things i'm interested in is cultural embodiment right yeah. and so for example i'll say you know, in russia someone will do something that's like very controlling very um uh, paranoid. Uh, there'll be a sense of my colleague. I was with my colleague yesterday, and she was very worried about something. Yeah. And I said, and I said, that's really Russian. 
to, yeah. be, to, to be anxious in that situation. In yeah, and they, good, and they had good freaking reason to be anxious because... And, and oh, there's, there's good historical reasons for, for these cultures. Again, it's not blaming, it's just saying yeah. there's a tendency that I see consistently in this culture, and there's evidence based on that if you want to look up the data as well. Sure. Um, but then... But my, you could my, just say my, they're, neuro- they're neurotic arseholes, right? But instead, well, right, but my, here's the thing. My yeah. colleague or student will always say, no, 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 it's not my culture. And Americans are the fucking worst at this. They'll say, uh, no, no, I'm an individual. It's not my culture. Uh, and there, this refusal to acknowledge the kind of cultural embodiment and the cultural factors America, there. Americans have no idea. I've had an American say to me, France has a culture, we have an economy. I mean, Americans, <laughs> you know, nobody thinks they have a culture. I mean, yes. Okay. It's the invisible embodied layer because the yeah. indivi- and we much rather would be considered and I understand why, because there's dignity in being considered as an individual, right? Like, this is the social justice thing. They get this wrong. They say, you are just your skin color, your ethnicity, your sexuality. Yeah, yeah, One yeah. of the limited categories that they've decided matter. And they're not seeing the dignity of the individual and saying, you know what? And yeah, yes. I might be white, but I also grew up pretty poor and had a rough childhood, you know. But it's, there's something about people loving that individual level mm-hmm. of analysis that means that they don't like attributions which are... Um, anything other than that. Did you just invoke intersectionality? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, and there's infinite sections. Therefore, the entire thing collapses on itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe. So, um, yeah, where were we with that? So other biases, what are some of the other ones that you might see, like confirmation bias, or like a yogi goes, you know what, I... I, you know, I, I've, I did this meditation and then I got more, uh, suddenly I got more money today. Well, here's all this, this meditation has worked. Yeah. Well, that's called, uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc. It happened before it. So it caused it. So it happens in the homeopathy example. It happens in, um, and lots of examples. I mean, people change their diet or something like that. They think, oh, I cut out, uh, I cut out carbs and I lost weight. Yeah, it's really difficult to replace those 1,500 calories of carbs that you eat every day. <laughs> That's why you lost weight. It's nothing, so to, just, do with, it's nothing to do with the carbs. And that might have just, something to do with the carbs, but anyway. They just had less calories is what exactly, you're saying, exactly. right? Yeah, it's a non specific thing. So it's, it happened before it, so it caused it. We do that all the time. Uh, another good one is that we, we um, believe in accordance with our behaviors. So you'd want your beliefs, your higher faculties – to drive your behaviors. You want your higher cognitive faculties, your higher self, your rationality, your reasons, even mm. your intuition if you want to determine a lot of what you do in the world, the choices you make is something like that. That's not what happens. Our behaviors determine what we believe. So people who, for example, smokers, they do experiments like this and they say, uh, you know, here's the evidence of smoking. They're more likely to say, oh, that's a load of bollocks. You know, can't, believe, can't trust the scientists or people that don't vaccinate can't trust the science or climate change d- deniers as well. So uh, uh, if, you sh- if you drive a Ford F-150, you're much more likely to think climate change is a load of bollocks. Why? Because you might have to drive a fucking smaller car. So our behaviors determine our beliefs rather than the other way around. That's we have the, this that's idea, we have, we have this idea that, you know what, I've sat down and I've worked it all out. And I've come to this conclusion. Yes, which is not what happens. Yes. And I, I, I had this one where sort of politics shifted a little bit. And I suddenly realized that most of my beliefs weren't that examined by the evidence. I, I'd simply taking it on as a sort of structure that made sense as a whole. So this wasn't just the yes. behavior was dictating it, but it was like myself was dictating. It's like, I am a liberal person, therefore... I believe that yes. Um, yes. immigration is good for an economy. And now that may or may not be true. Let's, let's take that yeah. question. Is immigration good for an economy? That may or may not be true, but I'd already had a point of view based on the fact that, okay, well, I'm, yeah. I see myself as a liberal person, therefore Yeah, I'm a Republican, so climate change is bollocks and abortion, abortion is immoral. It doesn't work the other way around. It, like, it hasn't actually been examined. No. And, I, and, I, and I, I think there's so much of this in the embodiment point of view, which is like, Okay, I'm a yoga teacher, therefore I have to believe in chakras, I have to believe in the koshas, I have to believe in the, uh, the, uh, you know, the um, Ayurvedic view of medicine, uh, I have to believe that green smoothies are good for you, because it comes with not just the behavior, like I do yoga, therefore it must cure everything, but it also comes with uh, a self-view, which is almost even more dangerous. 
Yeah, it's cool. My favorite Buddhist, by the way, is a guy called Stephen Batchelor, who wrote a book, Buddhism Without yes, Beliefs. Yes, yeah, British he's, guy. Yeah. he's the best. Yeah, British guy. That's absolutely the best. He says, you know, all of that belief stuff doesn't matter at all. You know, what matters is the practice. Yeah, great guy. And in Buddhism, it's an interesting one because there's a debate about, say, reincarnation in Buddhism. And is that necessary to be a Buddhist? To believe in reincarnation. Well, the Buddha didn't. And this, I, according to Stephen Batchelor, the Buddha didn't say any of that stuff. But what Buddhism has successfully done, why it's such a successful religion, is it sort of melded itself with the indigenous religions of Tibet and the indigenous religions of Indi India and, and other. It, didn't, it sort of adapted itself, and different forms of Buddhism have adapted themselves to local religion and 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 become different as become a different strain of Buddhism, if, if you will. So I don't know why I not an expert, but that that sounds like a fairly credible way of describing some of the supernatural beliefs from Buddhism. I think Buddhism's become quite popular because it in the Western modern world because it does have this potential to be rational and is even a I think it's called the Kalama Sutra. There's a piece of the, out of the Buddhist kind of classic text where it says, "Don't believe it because the ancients say it. Don't believe it because of this." And it basically says, "Only believe it if it's rational or you have evidence for it." And, um, you know, there is that sort of rational trend to Buddhism, but as you say, it gets associated with various religions and various other kind of belief systems that are out there. So it's interesting as, as, as one of the big influences on the embodiment world, Buddhism has that uh, tendency, whereas I'd say Hinduism has it less, which is one of the other big influences on the whole sort of embodiment field. Mm. I mean, what are some of the least rational things you, you hear in this world? I mean, I, I've heard things from California homeo homeo teachers. Homeo homeopathy is just water. I mean, that's for sure. That's the, uh -huh. thing, that, that's the thing. Of all of these things, that's the thing that I, you know, be least open to. <laughs> right. The, the, yeah. the biggest. And what about in, in, like, in your yoga class that you go to, for example? I know you started going to a yoga class again recently. And yeah, it, yeah, yeah. What, what comes up in that that oh, you just roll just, your fucking just, eyes? I just don't pay any attention to the first five minutes of it, really. Uh, <laughs> you know, no. I mean, I, I sit, I sit, I, I sit, and I and I try and you know center myself as well, but I don't listen to any of the chakra stuff or any of that kind of stuff. I mean, chakras for me were operated a very effective metaphor no question that they work as uh, that yes. a metaphor but they there's not a, you know if you cut someone open you're not going to find a fucking chakra that's for sure yes right? I, I i i think this is really important distinction for people who are uh in embodiment worlds is what's a useful metaphor and what is actually the case objectively and i think it's this distinction between subjective and objective both of which matter because in embodiment by definition the subjective is is important it's a subjective view of the body However, one does not dictate the other. So I may feel like there is energy running through my body, and that's very useful to work with and very significant to my well-being and my ability to throw something sure. like, you know, or whatever. But there isn't an actual electricity going through there. And you could claim it's piezoelectricity in the fascia or something like this. But I, I think the fundamental mistake I see people making in embodiment is to take a subjective feeling and turn it into an objective reality rather yes. than just keeping it in the realm of the subjective. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the body trivially has chemical energy in it, trivially has electrical energy in it, trivially has mechanical energy in it. Those are trivially true. But whether there's a, the sort of energy that they talk about, uh, which is transferred from person to person, you know, I would, I would be skeptical about that. So well, you're a big reader. You get, also get people on your show that are kind of super expert kind of rational people want to big up your podcast just so listeners can be tempted who are some of the people you've had on had on well uh, the biggest guy is going to be on this thursday he's the minister for climate change from new zealand uh and he used to work for future considerations but he went back at the age of 35 wow. and said i'm going to become a politician and wow. uh and now he's a minister in government he lost like seven elections in a row and then he became head of the green party and now he's deputy finance minister and minister for climate change. So he's a big guy. I had the head of IBM. Dan Pink? I haven't had him. Oh, well, you had Dan Pink. No, I, oh, Stephen Pinker. No, Stephen, Stephen Pinker. Pinker. That's Stephen, what Stephen Pinker was going to come on, and then, and then uh, he, I chased him a few times and eventually mm -hmm. said, you know what, I better not. I mean, I had him booked. Uh, he would have been a big, big win. Uh, people of that ilk, you know, I haven't had someone quite as big as Pinker yet, but I had the head of IBM's artificial intelligence business. That would be interesting for your business people. Uh, yeah. I've had a, I had a guy who's um, one of the sort of founding guys. I mean, he probably would hate that moniker of modern stoicism. He's a yes. philosopher called Massimo Pigliucci. And uh -huh. as, a, 
as an alternative to sort of a lot of the wisdom traditions come from the spiritual world. And, and there's a lot of wisdom in the wisdom traditions, but uh, there's also wisdom traditions from uh, early, um, from Stoicism, which is uh, early first millennium, first millennium is like. And that's getting big now. There's whole Stoicism conventions, you know, but YouTube is massive. Yeah, like yeah, it's Marcus massive. Aurelius is coming back into fashion. 2000 years later i mean it's funny how these things swing around it it is funny good yeah yeah so he's one of those guys i had him and i had a woman whose main job is teaching philosophy to children in schools she's great uh we're gonna get jordan peterson on you and him have a little chat is that well you know i would i would have jp on but i feel like i i mean i would certainly my only reluctance would be is to take on jp i'd have to do so much work Yes. Because I, most of what he says is complete fucking tripe. But yet I would not want to go toe-to-toe with him on stuff he's been talking about for a decade and stuff that I've seen on his head talk. You know what I mean? Like my, you know, I mean, yeah, a lot of the yeah, stuff yeah. he talks about, like cultural, cultural Marxism. I mean, you know, I'd want to be an expert on cultural Marxism so that I could go toe-to-toe with someone who thinks that this is the... So anyway, so I, I, I wouldn't have him on because I wouldn't want to lose. Uh, and I think on a lot of... <laughs> Lose. That's a hell of a frame for the guest on. <laughs> well, I, 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 I wouldn't want to. I, I don't want. I don't want to give him a free pass on the things that he says, which I find. <laughs> you know what? I, Let's not get into the JP argument actually, because it's but, just but one you know, more thing I want. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go on. Finish, go on. Finish no, no, on no, 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 no. I mean, I, I, anyway, right, 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 right. I'm probably I'm not. So, I'm probably not challenging enough on my podcast, but I anyway. I anyway. Yes. I've got a bit more challenging on the podcast of late. I haven't been in that mood today, but there's a few that I've challenged on, particularly on some of the sort of social justice stuff. But it's, um, I also have a thing on if I'm basically not there to make a guest look good, why, you know, I want to have basic friendliness towards a guest. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't want someone on that I was actively sort of hostile to or thought they spoke. You know, I don't do takedowns. You know, that's not what I do. Well, actually, I was surprised on your Facebook page when you called me out for insulting one of your people because I, uh, if someone's, an arsehole on my Facebook page, I'll call them what I want to call them. I mean, I don't, I don't encourage it and I don't do it, make a routine of it, but you know, if someone's... The rule I have is that people can disagree and disagree strongly, but if they get into just purely ad hominem insults, absolutely. I won't host it. I, it's a, that's an absolutely great, great standard and something like that. And there are people who I know have said that you're uncivil in various ways or something like that and actually that's a, <laughs> that's a rule that i wouldn't have expected i was like oh I'm, wow i'm that's... civil as fuck mate <laughs> okay la- <laughs> last thing last yeah, thing yeah, poker yeah. so can we talk a little bit about poker before we wrap up it's a bit of a wild card you're the first person we had on that's a serious poker player you would cut you you rank in terms of you know, not top few in the world, but you, you, you've you played in Poker World Championships. Top, top few hundred. I mean, top, top few hundred, right. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. and, and you you could be a full-time poker professional did you not also want to do other things, right? That could be something you do as, as a full-time job if you wanted. And you, your total earnings are people can see online as well, right? Like that's yeah, something yeah, yeah. you can, you can, and we, we're not talking tens of pounds here. No, hundreds of thousands. But I mean, I, I, I've been a game, a main, a mind sport guy. I was a, I played bridge for England. I represented Queen and Country on a few, <laughs> on a few occasions. And uh, I played professional backgammon and I'm not very good at chess, but I played that. So anyway, so poker, yeah, I take it very seriously. And t- I'll tell you the truth. I make a lot of my money, most of my money some years from poker because writing books isn't by itself a profitable <laughs> thing. Now I want to write, I want to write a uh, Dan Pink. Uh, the podcast cost me $1,200 a month right now. You know, that's what it costs me to put the podcast on the air, right? I'm not wow. anything in return. Mine doesn't cost that much. Let's talk afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so 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 I play poker basically. So, you know, I've got two small children. And so to finance the lifestyle of a intellectual dilettante and a sort of Steven Pinker wannabe, which is, you know, how I self-describe, <laughs> a, a Richard Dawkins wannabe or something like that. Yeah, I, I, I play I play poker. So, yeah. So, so what are the main lessons that can be learned from poker for the rest of us? Because I, I hear, but my wife and I have conversations about this most weeks. Well, that life is probabilistic. And people go, oh, I did that and it worked. It's possible to do the right thing and have it turn out badly. And it's possible to do the right thing and have it come out well. You shouldn't yes. be seduced. Wall Street people do this all the time. You know, My father, who is really, I shouldn't use this word. What word am I going to use? Demented when it comes to his understanding of stock markets, made buckets 
I said, Dad, yes. the stock market's gone up 50%. You know, a monkey would, ma- would have made buckets, but he attributes that to his own success. But life is full of probabilistic outcomes, you know, and we are often mm. making small gambles. So life is more like poker than like chess. And so, yeah, you can do the right thing and have it turn out badly. You can do the wrong thing and have it turn out very well. And that's very important if you're starting businesses or whatever you're doing is like there's a certain riskiness of the universe. There's a certain probabilistic nature of the universe. Um, God does play dice. <laughs> um, yeah, like I've just had this conference, which was a big success. And people were saying to me, why do you, did, did, do you think it did so well? And I said, yeah, well, we managed it pretty well. And we had this factor and that factor. And some of it was just timing or luck. And it's, it's kind of trying to, trying to tease out some of those values, you know, and all, all some, of the, some of what happened. Like, it was incredibly professionally run. I mean, from a distance, I've been in, uh, in lots of five-day conferences. I got a daily email from you saying what had happened and what was up. I mean, that's awesome. But that's you know? great. And I'm not saying we didn't, you know, we didn't work no, you, well. No, you kicked we arse. You kicked arse. Well, but, <laughs> but also, like, some of it was simply down to the Facebook algorithm for how, how, much, how much money a Facebook ad cost at that time. And yeah. if that changes, that's utterly beyond my control. So this, do you know what I mean? I don't want to attribute all, all of its success to my level of skill when, when there's also just this other factor out there, which is, is, uh, is a huge factor in terms of how many people came to the conference itself. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a remarkable thing. I mean, 15,000 people. It's good. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing... So you did 15,000 people, right? It was, it was 15,541. 15, I mean, that's an insane number. I mean, Richard Strozzi Heckler, who's been at this for 40 years or something like that, you know, he he does uh, maybe not even hundreds of people a year, maybe a few hundred people a year in the small hundreds. So his work, his legacy is, you know, touching maybe over his lifetime because of the small numbers he works with touched a few thousand people, you know. That's the, yeah, mir- the, mir- the, mir- the miracle of the internet, the miracle of YouTube. Yeah, mm-hmm. Paul Linden said the same thing, you know, it's... um. Uh, and it's depth and breadth issues, and there's also you know yeah, just, yeah, I don't yeah. want to compare because it's different. Of course, things, but um, yeah, it's a it's a big world. Listen, we need to wrap up. I'm yeah. cool with a student now. In terms of um, finding you, your Patreon, your website, where where do, where do people go? Oh yeah, think bigger, think better podcast on iTunes. I mean, that's the really the place where you know if you're intellectually curious. I have an incredibly wide array of guests, everything yes. from philosophers, from scientists to I've had you cool. on there. Uh, to chief, chief executives, to cabinet ministers, so a really wide range. And I really want to be talking about the most important problems that the human race faces. So think bigger, think better, and the rest of it you can kind of forget about. You'll find out in the podcast or anything like that. But that's really where, that's my main big contribution to the world right now. Great. And I just encourage people to listen to that because for me, the ones I've listened to were uh, really did like what, what it says on the tin. It's like, okay, now I'm thinking about climate change. I'm walking down the street. Or, you know, think better. It's like, okay, I'm actually getting a little bit more rigorous about how I'm thinking about my own course that I'm putting on as a result of, you know, the skepticism or whatever that's on there. Well, thank um, you. Also, thank you. Also encourage people as well to uh, put their money where their mouth is with both of us. Um, we were just talking about this the other day that it's, it's, you know, Patreon is a really nice way of people supporting things they want to see more of and not just taking things free, but actually saying, you know what, I got some value from that. I'm going to give, give back, actually going to give some money. And it doesn't have to be, you know, half the cup of half the cost of a cup of coffee or whatever. It doesn't have to be a huge amount, but it's um, it's a, it's a funny thing that people will pay for things if they have to, but not support people who are giving. I, to I find it extraordinary. Generously. But your boy Jordan Peterson has almost ten thousand contributors on Patreon, almost ten thousand. So, so it's clear that sometimes people will do it, and I'm uh, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to kind of figure out. Like, like I have three Patreon subscribers currently. And and now I'm not trying to make my this is my income stream, but part of me goes, that's a bit odd, because I get all this great feedback and people love the podcast. Well, I didn't, <laughs> I did, I didn't know that, but I'll give you two bucks a month at the end of this call, just because, just because, you and know. It, and it, maybe we haven't pushed it very much, and I, you know, I didn't want to be too pushy at first. Well, I, I didn't know, I did, I didn't know about it. I did, but it hasn't been my main thing to sort of push. Yeah. We just put it on there because we thought, hey, maybe people will want to put something up, and it just didn't really happen. And I was like, ah. Oh. Well, that okay. and poker that and poker are my main things at the moment. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I hope the cards land well for you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I think, I think, oh, I, yeah. Thank you, mate. I have to go, mate. This is yeah. good. Always, oh, always, oh, always good talking to you, man. You're oh, doing, and I'm going to see you in Denver soon. We're going to be um, 
eating we're gonna, steaks and we're talking go for, monuments. We're going for a night out, mate. We're going to have a night out, isn't it? <laughs> In Denver. All right. All right Paul, then. thank you so much. Appreciate Lovely. your time. Cheers, mate. Subscribe to get more. And you can also leave us a review on iTunes, which helps with our rankings. So really appreciate that. Um, equally, if you want to support the podcast even more, then fund us. Um, go to Patreon. Give us a dollar per episode. Um, those who don't know, Patreon's a really good way of supporting things you want to see more of in the world. I know like so much is available for free now. And, you know, what I'd say is a lot of energy and effort goes into this podcast. Um, I put it out there for free so everyone can get it. You know, more than I work on this. Everyone that wants it can have it for free. Uh, and if you want to support us, it is really appreciated. So it's patreon.com slash Mark Walsh. Uh, and of course, if you want any in-person training, you can visit embodiedfacilitator.com. There's loads more resources there too. Till next time, welcome home to the body.